Hello, everyone. Due to recording outside, there is occasional background noise. We apologize in advance for any interruptions in the clarity of the conversation. And welcome back to the Cricket Cafe podcast. This is the second installation of the podcast, and it's the affiliate podcast of the Gummy Cub Productions. And today I am joined with my mother, Jessica Byerly. Hello. And she has been a teacher for eight years and has even had the unique experience of teaching abroad, although she had to return to the States early due to COVID-19. And now she is teaching in a local elementary school and learning how to maneuver the ever-changing landscape of teaching during a global pandemic. So, hello. Hello. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. How How is uh, winter break treating you? Oh, so excited to be <laughs> having time off. Um, I was in my pajamas most of the day yesterday, uh, took a shower, got dressed, and that was the extent of the excitement of my day. <laughs> so unfortunately, you're not one of those people who can do their work in their pajamas still because you still have to go to the school to teach from your classroom, even though none of your kids are there. That's true. Yeah, I go to school every day and I teach from my classroom um, using Zoom and um, an iPad to be able to project things so that kids can see what I'm looking at and sh screen sharing and using yeah. YouTube videos and um, yeah it's a whole lot of everything all yeah a, a lot of new new teaching uh, <coughs> skills skills that you've had to yep. learn to adapt to teaching during COVID absolutely and I'm super thankful for my coworkers who have been really collaborative and be willing to share ideas and um, being willing to work together yeah yeah um so you've had some pretty rough we'll get into this more later on okay. but you've had some pretty rough school years with you know depending on who's in your class at former schools mm -hmm. how has this sort of massive shift of the way you have to teach like matched up with some of the rougher years you've had um <clears throat> well teaching in this format is different in a lot of ways because you're not physically in the room with the kids and so you're not having to deal with the same types of distractions or interaction between the kids that yeah. then where they self-distract mm -hmm. um so it's more getting them to show up at all well <laughs> i mean some for some kids it's a struggle to come um, I think for some kids it's confusing being at home, but they're, they're still doing schoolwork. Yeah. And so, you know, being able to create a space where the kids feel like they're at school or they know that this is their designated school spot, I think yeah. has been a little bit of a difficulty for some families. And being able to help their kids with creating structure that normally families would rely on schools to provide. Yeah, the time you go and you go see your teacher and your friends and then you come home right. and you do your homework. Right, and right. So, yeah, learning curve <coughs> for everybody. Yeah. So I one of the things that I wanted to talk about today was sort of just the process of what goes into getting your teaching credential, your, your personal... Um, educational background and you know the process of being a student teacher and all that sort of thing that I think a lot of people don't necessarily know like the specific um, programs you have to go through and the tests you have to pass to become a teacher um, so you get your bachelor's degree in whatever subject area is interesting to you mm -hmm. um, some people don't necessarily go into college thinking that they'll be a teacher so they pursue whatever is interesting to them and then um, 
at some point along the way, they decide they're going to become a teacher. Mm -hmm. Essentially, student teaching is a fifth year of college. Hmm. Um, And so you apply and you go through the program. The program I went to was at Sonoma State, where I also did my undergraduate degree. Um, It's a year-long program. And the way they do it there um, is split up into two semesters. The first semester, you're considered a part-time student teacher, where you're only in the classroom a couple days a week, and the rest of your time is spent at the university doing college classes. Mm-hmm. Um, and is that when you're like taking the classes to learn how to teach as yes, well? Yes, they're instructional classes. Gotcha. Um, and some of them are also um, child development classes and things like that. But most of the classes that you're taking at that time are helping to prepare you to be able to deliver instruction. Yeah. On the second semester, you're considered a full-time student teacher where you're in the classroom the majority of the week. I think I was there four and a half days. And then, um, uh, it's been a while now. I think I was taking two classes, maybe mm-hmm. one or two at that point. But the majority of your time is spent in the classroom. Um my first placement was in a two three um multi-age classroom and then my second placement was in a four five um multi-age classroom and you did all of your student teaching at a year-round charter school right i did at mary collins school cherry valley in petaluma yeah Mm -hmm. how is that different from teaching at a normal school year so This particular school did roughly a 45-15 schedule. So the kids, well, so the school ran for about 45 days or so, Mm -hmm. and then the kids would have 15 days off. Um, So that means that they start school mid-July and then stop in June when everybody else stops, or May, depending on what the school year is that year. Um, but then they take um, a three-week break in October for mm-hmm. fall. Um, and then they still have the Thanksgiving holiday winter break. Spring break then is three weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they're off, like I said, end of May, beginning of June. So their summer is roughly a month to mm-hmm. six weeks, depending Um And what I like about that system is that everybody gets built-in breaks throughout the school year. Mm -hmm. Um, When everybody is starting to kind of feel run down, then um, you get a chance to take a break and kind of reset and come back. Um, And with a shortened summer, you don't get that summer slide um, where students forget a lot over you know two and a half months three months depending on the summer um and then the following school year there's a lot of reteaching that has to get done there is still some of that that has to happen but not quite as much yeah it seems it seems a lot more efficient to to me anyway yeah um um, (laughs) i know it's a system that a lot of european um schools utilize yeah um the break the summer long summer break goes back to when we were more of an agrarian society Mm -hmm. and so families were were really needed their children to be at home to help them harvest time yeah 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 um but generally we don't live in that type of a society um anymore um and so I would think it would probably make the most sense to move away from a more traditional calendar, what we think of as a traditional school calendar. Yeah. So going back to the process of becoming a teacher, um, you have a multi, uh, what is it? Multi-subject degree. Yes, Yes, so you can have two different types of teaching credentials. One is a multiple subject teaching credential, um, which is what elementary teachers have you can have that also in high school but then you would have to be teaching more than one subject right most high school teachers have 
a single subject credential. So they're only credentialed to teach in that specific uh, subject. Right. And but so even though you don't, you have a multi multiple subject degree, you do have a specialization in reading instruction. Yes, I have a master's degree in curriculum and instruction with an emphasis in reading. Yeah. So um, what made you decide to specialize in reading instruction? Um, well, the school I had been teaching at several years ago is a Title I school. And what, so, what does so that, that mean? means that it's a low income school. Hmm. Um, and historically, um, students who are coming from low income families are two to three years behind academically. Wow. And so what I was finding is that when I was teaching second grade, I was interacting with kids who um, were really reading at like a kindergarten level. Not yeah. all of them. There were definitely kids that were reading at grade level, but a, enough of them were reading below grade level that I felt like I needed some more help being to be able to instruct them. Yeah. So that they could get caught up. Um, so that they didn't get left behind. Yeah. And so you actually finished your master's degree while you were teaching abroad. Yes. Um, I chose to do an online program because um, I didn't want to relocate to do my master's right. degree. So I did it online. And so, yes, I finished it wh while uh, I was settling in to teaching in Djibouti, Africa. So... What led you to teach abroad? So it was something I was always interested in. I first heard about it during my orientation for doing my student teaching. Hmm. Um, part of the orientation was letting you know of all of the different possibilities and things that you could do with your teaching degree. And one of the things that they mentioned during that orientation was teaching abroad. Hmm. So that was something I hadn't really considered before and so I just kind of tucked it away um, until I was ready to be able to do that um, and I was ready for a change from the current school that I was at and my sister Sadie Ann who is also a credential teacher um, was ready to be teaching abroad as well so we went to a job fair in San Francisco um, and heard a bunch of different um, pitches, basically, by schools, international schools, um, about their school and the positions that they had available. We must have sat through 15 to 20 presentations that day. Um, and uh, so it was a lot of information to try to wade through, but it gives you a chance to hear a little bit about the schools, what they're looking for, where they are, those kinds of things. Um, and so that helped us narrow down where we were interested in interviewing. Um, so the next day, we went into the ballroom of this hotel where the okay. job fair was happening. Um, and uh, it was kind of like speed dating you, oh. you go and you talk to the people. You have like four or five minutes to convince them basically to give you an interview, um, which it really wasn't that hard. Um, they were pretty much, it seemed like, willing to talk to whoever was willing to come. Were there a lot, of, a lot of teachers there? Uh, yeah. Yeah, there are hundreds of teachers. So it wasn't like you showed up so you were guaranteed a job? Uh, no. It was still fairly uh, competitive. Yeah, um, absolutely. So we signed up. Um, and then we had interviews starting that afternoon and then the following morning. Um, and so we had our interview and initially they were trying to deter us from going to Djibouti because um, they wanted a couple to go. Mm. But when they found out that we were sisters and we could live together, they were very yeah. excited at the prospect of having us come. Convenient. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and if I remember correctly, you had to have your interview with them at like 10 o'clock at night. So what happened was we signed up for our interview. We had our initial interview that afternoon. And then 
um, they had us talk with the current director mm. or the director at that time because she was transitioning to another school. Um, but yes, we had an, a conversation with her. It was two thirty in the morning our time. Oh my goodness! Um, so <laughs> yeah, it was a Skype call, um, and then we had a follow up interview the next morning, and then they offered us the job less than twenty four hours later. Wow! Yeah, so it was That's a crazy. pretty quick process. Wow! Yeah. Uh, <laughs> how soon? How soon after you? were given the job did you move to Africa um I think the interviews were in February and we landed in Africa in August so six-ish months later yeah and um how was it different teaching there with the with a different organization as opposed to in a public school system here um so it's essentially a private school Mm -hmm. Um, it's a fairly large organization. Um, they have 30 or so schools. What organization was it? Uh, Quality Schools International. And so they have 30 or so schools around the world. Um, and QSI Djibouti is just one of their schools. It's one of two schools that they had in Africa. The other Mm -hmm. school was in Benin, Africa. Oh, okay. So on the west coast. Other side. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Almost like... Yep, pretty much straight <laughs> across. That's funny. Yeah. Um, I imagine that was a rather jarring culture shock. Yeah. Um, so it was a French colony, and so mm-hmm. the majority of people speak French. Um, so I know a little French. I'm not conversational. Yeah. Um, but it was enough to say hello and ask where things were and... Um, not get too lost right Um, which was a concern which was a concern (laughs) yes but i was able to ask direct directions from the gendarmes and they (laughs) kind of looked at us confused because we're white americans (laughs) most people assume that we were french until we started speaking Uh, and then they're like wait (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah something wrong um so it's crazy hot there. Yeah. So when we landed, it was 120. Um, and it stayed that way <laughs> until um, November, December. So it's a very, very small airport in Djibouti. So you literally have to walk out of the airplane across the asphalt to get yeah. into the airport. Oh um, and so, you know, you get, you know, you get all your stuff and you're walking down the aisle or, and then there's and the like heat a, waves. yeah, like a, a wall of hot air oh hits goodness. you. Um, so that took some adjusting yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, my glasses would just fog up walking outside and um, no. you would just <laughs> drip sweat, not doing anything, just sitting there, standing there. Um, yeah. So you just drink buckets of water. <laughs> and the, the ocean was also very hot. Yeah, that time <laughs> of the year. <clears throat> so it's on the south end of the Red Sea, mm-hmm. which is connected to the Indian Ocean, which is the warmest ocean in the world yeah so it's warm anyways but when the outside temperature is that hot it's not refreshing to be in the water no respect um (laughs) yeah so um you know at first we went a couple times and just kind of waded through the water and it was kind of like a cool hot tub Mm. um so not quite what you're hoping for to be able to cool down (laughs) um but uh the people there are super friendly um everybody was really nice and even if they couldn't speak to you they were trying to help um nice so that's a little bit different than here (laughs) um (laughs) so yeah we made some really good friends in Djibouti um one who I still talk to at least once a week probably and she lives in France, right? She's French? She is French. Uh, Leah and her daughter Jade, who was in my class, um, they are French. Her husband 
worked for the French military, so they're stationed there. They're still there. Um, they'll be going back home to France um, this summer. Mm-hmm. So after you came, were s- brought back, sent back, you had to teach long distance from your students, which meant that you were up very, very late so that it would be morning for them. Yeah, so when COVID hit, um, you know, we were looking at the news and all the things that were happening back here, and it took about three or four weeks later for things to really start happening in Djibouti, where we were. Um, So we ended up leaving Djibouti at the end of April, or no, I'm sorry, at the end of March. It was the beginning of April. Um, and so we still had two or so, two and a half months of school. Um, and with a 10 hour difference, they're 10 hours ahead of us, um, we would do our teaching late at night so yeah. that it was morning for the kids in our yeah. class, which we did over Zoom. Yeah. And so you decided, were, would you have been able to go back if you had wanted to? Yes. Um, Sadie Ann and I still were able to return if we wanted to, um, but we chose not to go back because of the situation. We just weren't sure what was going to happen or if there was going to be another situation that we would have to be evacuated again. Yeah. Um, it just seemed like at this time it was better to just stay at home. Yeah. And then wait for things to stabilize again before we try and venture out again. Yeah. I remember when, when things first started shutting down, one of my first f- fears was that you were going to just be stuck there. That you were just going to be, like, trapped in Africa in the middle of, like, monsoon season. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that that was definitely a concern. Um, my So Sadie Ann's best friend, Anna Rose, arrived. Um to for a visit and about I don't know two days after she left she arrived the government shut down all the borders including the airport Um, and so there was no way for us to leave Um, the US Embassy had to arrange for a special flight for us to be able to get out of the country Mm -hmm. Um, so without their assistance we would have been Stuck there. Stuck there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Until I think they opened the airport up again. It was midsummer, I think. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, we're we're very happy that you were able to come home. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Um, It's been good. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And so since then, you relocated to Ukiah, Mm -hmm. and you're now teaching at a local elementary school here. Yes. And it's. Now, it's just so much more fun that you get to have learning how to teach over Zoom. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it definitely has its challenges. Um, it's a lot harder to teach when you're not in the same room with the kids. Yeah. Proximity has a lot to do with developing relationships, um, kind of quickly checking in with kids, seeing how they're understanding, if they need more explanation of something or less or Mm -hmm. you know it's a little bit harder to gauge their needs Mm -hmm. um on the other side of a screen um and they're also not getting the same social input that they normally would be getting right and um so their social and emotional needs are not being met in the same way um we're doing our best you know we um like i said I do an art project every Friday, so the kids get to do some kind of an art thing with me. Um, I try. I we have lunch on Fridays together, and they all they get together and talk. And um, once a month, I do a a movie of some kind. Um, so this week we had hot chocolate and Frosty the Snowman party. Perfect. Yeah, love it. <laughs> And you also do sometimes um, let them do breakout sessions, yes. right, to just spend time with just getting to talk to each other. Yeah, and- yeah, I have done that from time to time, which they absolutely love. Um, so I'm not part of any of their breakout groups. I just kind of check in to see if they're 
still doing okay, or if they're ready to switch who they're talking to. Um, so I just facilitate. I don't yeah. really participate. Yeah. Yeah. It's coming back. So recently there was talk of and so, uh, a series of debates about whether or not to start going back to a hybrid system mm -hmm. and trying to get input from other school districts that have had a pretty um, successful mm -hmm. hybrid uh, transition. Yeah, and so um, this our our school district is still completely distance, mm -hmm. but is there still are they are there still plans to try to go to hybrid in the spring or are they thinking it's going to have to get put off longer or? um i haven't heard any specific dates um at least not that i'm aware of i always i skim a lot of emails just because mm -hmm. i have so much to do um so there aren't any dates that stand out for me but the the hope is always that we'd be able to go back um to some type of in-person instruction mm -hmm most likely uh, um, a hybrid situation where we would break the class up into two groups. Um, one group would come two days a week, the other group would come two days a week, and then there would be a total distance day for everybody. Um, the We did have a conversation with another school district, um, several counties south, um, and what they decided to do was they're still doing a hybrid, but everybody comes to school every day. So they still have two groups, but one group comes in the morning and then the other group comes in the afternoon, which I think would probably be a better situation. Mm -hmm. You'd be teaching to the sets of lessons twice, right? but everybody's there. Um, and then you don't have to then figure out what to do for the kids who are at home right um so uh, the hybrid system that our local school district is considering um would double our workload mm. so why why did they settle on that instead of something that seemed a bit more streamlined um i'm not sure um i wasn't part of those conversations um and it could be now that we've had a chance to talk with some other school districts that they might rethink some of their Oof. thought process. <laughs> um, but I, have, I haven't heard anything different. But I know mm -hmm. that discussions are continuing and negotiations are still happening mm -hmm. to figure all of that out. Yeah. And um, all of the decisions that are being made in regards to the safety of the students has input from the local health officer right yes and is approved by the the health team yes for the county yes so it's not just a group of educators arbitrarily making decisions about what they think is best it's right. coming from the people who are in charge the doctors who are in charge of making the decisions for the mm -hmm. health of the community yeah so they have taken into consideration the county um, regulations and the health officers um, suggestions about how to do things um, and then there's a leadership team mm -hmm. who is in charge of making those decisions and they are giving teachers an opportunity to give their input which is mm -hmm. good so it's not just an arbitrary yes. decision that's being kind of just thrust upon us um, which, but which is we get to be part of yeah that decision making to a certain extent Right. At which, some point, which somebody not, just has to make a decision. Yes. But I think it is good that they are getting the educators' input on it because yes. that is oftentimes not the case. That's when absolutely it comes true. to the school system, a lot yes. of decisions are made by the suits who never have to <laughs> the see the suits. Yes. <laughs> who, whoever <laughs> it is making these decisions who never in the classroom don't have teaching experience and yeah. don't get input from teachers necessarily. That's right. They just sort of decide this is how it should be and right. everyone just kind of has to deal with it whether or not yep. it's actually in the best interest of the students right which is i think rather unfortunate right so it's nice that at least now um for 
a more for more localized issue like community regulating of COVID-19 it is good to see that there is input from the educators. Yeah, well I think there's a lot more transparency or there has to be because there's so many more people involved. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, no longer are parents just dropping their kids off at school right. and then collecting them at the end of the day. They're at home with their children, and so they're a lot more involved in the educational process yeah. than they ever have been previously. I mean, there's always super involved parents that, you know, volunteer in classrooms or on committees and those kinds of things. Um, but not all parents are in a position to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, however, given our current situation, they have to be. Um, either that or they have to make arrangements for their child to be with somebody else who can help facilitate school for them. Right. It, it really is taking a village now. Yes, yes. Mm. And I think in some ways it's good. Um, my personal opinion is that, in general, parents have abdicated a lot of their authority and responsibilities to the school mm-hmm. um, for various reasons. Um, mm-hmm. And so a lot of people are have been I think over reliant on schools and the school system to help them raise their children Mm -hmm. and and what I hear a lot is that you know from parents that you know I'm not a teacher I don't know how to do this um, wherein parents are their children's first teacher Mm -hmm. and it is the parents responsibility to educate their children Um, most parents choose to send their children to school and so are opting to have somebody else come alongside them and help them educate their children. But ultimately, the responsibility for educating a child belongs to the parents. Right. And so there is just that extra responsibility getting a little bit given back to the parents because now... Yes it's more that they are the ones who are having to come alongside the teachers right. in regards to the education of their children because right. they have to make sure that they they have their area and that they're doing their homework and they're mm-hmm. going to their Zoom classes. Right. So right. It isn't just, have a nice day, honey. Right. It's making sure they're sitting down and not doing, running off and doing silly things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so a lot of it is just providing a little bit more structure. Mm -hmm. You know, um, like I said earlier, I think it's confusing for a lot of kids to be at home, Mm -hmm. you know, in their living room where they play and watch TV, um, and now all of a sudden it's their classroom. Right. You know, and so having to create boundaries that they're not used to creating for themselves um, and boundaries that parents aren't necessarily used to creating because again their home is where they relax right you know and so I think parents have had to be a little bit more creative about how to make that work for kids um and as with anything some parents are more successful with it than others you know some of it is their own life and how things are going for them and their ability to um, help with their their children, um, you know, their work situation and whether or not they're able to be available or if they can find somebody else to help them mm-hmm. with that. You know, I have students, some students are at home, some students are with grandparents, others are with family, friends, um, daycare situations. Um, one of the local Native American tribes has set up a learning center. So a lot of their students, oh my goodness. whoa, a lot of their students go to the learning center, um, which helps really to facilitate some of their learning. Mm-hmm. They are also sending someone in to do like culture days yeah. with the students, right? Yeah. Um, so the Coyote Valley. Um, has sent in cultural I don't remember the title that they gave uh, it was cultural instructors of some kind but yeah so we had um, 
a special guest come to our class three days a, three days over was once a week for three days let me start over <laughs> <laughs> three weeks in a row <laughs> one day a week gotcha. um, and so she talked to the kids about um, basket making she's a hmm. basket maker and talked about the importance of dancing um, and some games that they that are important in their culture nice so she taught us some of those things and in fact um, they gave all of our teachers at our school um, books to read to the children oh. that are Native American themed books. That's really good. So yeah, it'll be exciting to share those with my class. Good for them to know the history of the land that they're on. Yes. Yeah. Were any of your kids surprised to learn any of, of that history? Um, or did they know about the Native tribes that... Uh, live here no like um one student said that they had never heard the word tribe before and so the um guest speaker had to explain what that meant and mm. um but you know through looking at the basket weaving and some of the symbols that they use in the basket weaving she was able to share some words um, in their language and the importance of those symbols um, and how they make baskets and use things from the area. That's great. Yeah. So they were really excited about it. That's right. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> so before we go, is there any last thoughts that you would like to share or any other of your um, experiences? Yeah. Teaching is both very challenging and very rewarding. Um, I love being with my students um, and it has been made difficult during this time with COVID-19, um, but I still get to interact with kids and they get super excited about things. And um, so that's always fun being a part of that process um, and seeing those aha moments. Mm -hmm. um, and um, teaching is really rewarding um, and you get to touch a lot of lives yeah um, you know you think about I have 24 students mm -hmm. you know and I've been teaching for eight years so that's quite a few kids that I've been able to interact with and families to help and to serve and um, so it's really fun being part of that process and getting to step into the lives of the children and um, hopefully having a positive impact yeah. that will carry them through the rest of their life. That's great. Well, thank you for being here. Thank and, you for having and me. And talking to us and for sharing your insight into sort of the, some of the maybe unknown sides of what it takes to be a teacher and um, the day-to-day struggles yes. of being a teacher and yes. even and but also the exciting things yes. about being a teacher um yeah all of the difficult things none of those things are why any of us do what we do sure. every day <laughs> um those are things that we have to endure but the reason why we go every day is for the love of being with the kids and helping them to learn and grow as mm -hmm. people that's great yeah <laughs> I'm just like yes, wonderful. <laughs> I think it. I think it's important for people to learn more about what it takes to be a teacher because teachers are in literally everybody's lives. Everyone, unless you're homeschooled for your entire life, everyone has had many teachers, and and it seems like less so recently but oftentimes teachers are sort of the unsung heroes who are kind of in the in the shadows of yes a lot of times um we get uh kind of lumped in with all of the societal ills and um those are somehow our fault <laughs> right. right um and so that can be difficult um yeah but gotta keep your eye on the prize yeah do it for the kids yep 
great. Well, thank you for being here with us. Thank you for having me. Um, and have a great winter holiday. Thank you. Um, and hopefully you are refreshed when you go back to the next semester yes. of your year. Yes, I'm already planning ahead. Oh, I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure you are. <laughs> yes. So thank you for being with us. This has been the second uh, Cricket Cafe podcast, the affiliate podcast of Gummy Cup Productions. Um, if you enjoyed what you heard just now, please consider giving a subscribe and a like and a share. And um, please check out our social medias, which will be coming soon. Thank you. <laughs>